Recognizing the problem is the first step to recovery. And that's why we stand proud to propose the motion, this house believes that the UN has failed the day. So let's start off by defining what failed means in this sense. Now failed obviously means it did not accomplish its goals. So really, what was the UN's goals? What did it need to do? Now the UN had really one or two main goals. First off, to protect human rights, and secondly, to remain united in the common interest, to protect each other and to protect human rights. So we are going to show you throughout the case today why it failed to protect and why it is accomplishing neither of these goals. And really why the UN is the antithesis of its antithesis of its name, and it's really the ununited nations. We will prove this to you through three main contentions. They all start with C. First, criteria. Secondly, cannot unite. And third, causes harm. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to get into the first contention, that of criteria. Now, why such a lofty goal, why such a lofty standard applied to the UN, that the whole the goal of protecting women's rights around the globe? We think that that's because what, that's what the UN was founded for. We look for proof of this in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Charter. I quote from the UN Charter, to gain our strength to maintain international peace and security, and from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was created by the UN. Whereas member states have pledged themselves to achieve, in cooperation with the United Nations, the promotion of, universal respect for, and observance of human rights. So when an organization places its own goals upon itself, we think that it should be held accountable to those standards, and that any lack of meeting those standards would result in it, not, in, in it being, a, in being a failure. So without, now I'd like to get into the second argument of how the UN cannot unite. Now the UN cannot unite for many reasons. The first one being the Security Council. We look at the Security Council, and it is the body of the UN that's in charge of all peacekeeping troops and operations. There are five permanent members, China, Russia, Britain, France, and the USA. Each of these five permanent members has a negative vote, otherwise known as a veto, which means that in order for peacekeeping troops to be deployed, the decision in the Security Council has to be unanimous. This almost never happens because of the different economic and political interests of each of these nations. We look at the example of Syria, where the UN simply wanted a motion condemning Bashar al-Assad, not even acting. But Russia simply vetoed it because it has strong economic and political ties with the nation of Syria. So the UN is not uniting and has failed to protect what is right. We look at the General Assembly and see that one nation, one vote. We see that this creates a situation where 18% of the world's population, through their leaders in the UN, could pass a resolution with a two-thirds majority. This does, it simply does not make sense. We look at it and we see that the countries that get voted onto certain councils or certain boards are the ones who spend the most foreign aid. And there's many examples of bribery, especially of smaller countries with smaller economies. And really, there's not the sort of negotiation, the discussion that we would like to see. It's simply gridlocked into political alliances and voting blocks, like the OPEC voting bloc or the Palestinian voting bloc. And we also see in the International Court of Justice, which was created for nations to bring complaints against each other and to settle these in a sort of court setting. But once again, this doesn't work. Enforcement for it rests on the Security Council. Obviously, when an action is brought against a Security Council member, they simply veto the resolution. This happened in the Nicaragua case, when Nicaragua brought an action against the U.S. for mining their harbors. The U.S. simply vetoed the motion and therefore escaped justice. And the U.N. is failing to protect countries like Nicaragua and people around the world. We look at the Human Rights Council, one of the most important aspects of the U.N. that it needs to be able to function in order to complete its goals. Now, the countries that make up the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, came to, some, some of them came to power through illegitimate means through human rights abuses. Some of them are dictators. So they don't really have the same goal, and they simply promote gridlock and an inability to do this. But what they can do is they can vote countries like Sudan and Mauritania onto the Human Rights Council. <coughs> Sudan, the land, where, the land of the Darfur massacre, and Mauritania, a country where 21%, I mean 20% of the population are slaves. These countries are supposed to be on the Human Rights Council protecting individuals around the globe, it simply doesn't work. This leads to nothing happening, as Margaret will later bring up examples of where this has happened countless times, over and over again. And the people around the world are the ones suffering from this shortcoming of the UN. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And although there may be good men in the UN, 
They are powerless, gridlocked, and overridden. Evil is triumphing, and the UN has failed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I forgot. I now stand for cross examination. Should the UN intervene in Canada? No. So, why not? Because Canadian governments are responsible governments. So, then what is a good reason to intervene? In a country where the exact situation, like, it, it would all depend on the situation. Like, if it was a country with, like, a small military or small, and there was huge genocide, like Rwanda or something. So what you're really saying is that um, that country should follow its own criteria as to when to intervene. No, a like a country should follow its own criteria. Rephrase that. A question. democracy organization. It should follow its own criteria. To intervene. Yeah, it should, and that, and that should be applied based on the situation, best on you know each individual circumstance. Will all countries agree? No. Did all countries agree before the UN? No, but we don't really see the countries agree more since the advent of the UN. So what you're telling me is that so they disagreed before and they're still disagreeing now, but how is that a problem of the UN? The UN said in its, like I said in my speech, the UN says in the charter that their goal was to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security. So it's up to the UN to try to unite countries in the best way possible. Are you aware that the UN has regulated international travel through safety standards? Um, no. Do you realize that the UN has also regulated international exports? Mm, I, I always thought that was more of the World Trade Organization. But aren't you aware that the UN has been a part of that process? Well, I guess they probably were to some extent. Um, are you aware that the UN helped 80 nations gain independence? Are you sure? Well, I guess that maybe they helped, yes, recognize them. Are you aware that the UN was key to eradicating smallpox? Smallpox and other diseases like that were going to be eradicated with the advent of new technologies, vaccines, and global economy. When did World War III occur? <laughs> Didn't. So, after all of these examples, wouldn't you agree by this premise that the UN has made progress in all of these areas? No, I think it's just helping to administer progress. Like, for example, World War III didn't occur because of mutually assured destruction or smallpox was eradicated because of Red Cross. But hasn't, haven't we seen improvements in the international trade? I don't know. I don't really think so. How can we protect people without violating borders? Sometimes it's necessary. But isn't it, a good, isn't it true that a good government uses judgment? Yes. So, is a government legitimate then if it violates its own rules? No. Are you aware that the UN is a government? And, yeah. Well, it is sort of to a certain extent. It's like a, it's like a voluntary, it's a voluntary organization that people adhere to. It's a little bit different from a government. But, but yeah. it is a democracy. Yes. Thank you. And now I'll call the first speaker of the negative team, Julian McLeod, who will speak for five minutes, then be cross-examined by the second affirmative speaker for three minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our case line for today is that the UN has made sub substantial progress. Today I will prove to you the most critical criteria and that the U UN's actions were either justifiable or unavoidable. My partner will prove that the benefits will outweigh the harms. I will first do my constructive argument and then clash with my worthy opponent. So, the cri our criteria is the most critical criteria. What we're trying to prove to you today is that the UN doesn't have to be successful 100% of the time for it not to have failed. So today, if you, in order for you to agree with side affirmative, you, they have to prove to you today that the UN is not making any progress towards its goals and that it, so it's not making any progress towards its goals, and it has to prove to you that the UN actually caused the harms that it's given. So I'll prove to you how it is making progress towards its Millennium Goals. For, and this all came from a UN 2010 report. So for Millennium, 
Millennium Development Goal Number One for Poverty: People living on less than a dollar twenty-five a day has reduced by 19 percent between 1990 and 2005 in, de in developing regions. Not only have we been successful in this area, but the other Millennium Development Goals as well. Globally, people attending primary school, globally people not attending primary school or secondary school, has dropped from 108 million to 61 million between 1999 and 2010, and that was a result of the UN. Or what about gender equality? We see that women's paid employment has gone up between the years of 1990 and 2010, and that morality. Morality rates for children under the age of five have declined by 35%, and UNICEF has been able to immunize 80% of children under five. But what about maternal deaths, with it, which is Millennium Development Goal number five? Now this one we are working on through schooling and education, because we see that when a young girl is educated, she is less likely to marry young, and this is preventing maternal deaths, or HIV. New infections are declining, especially in the sub-Saharan desert, and water. The world's population using improved water sources between 1990 and 2008 has improved by 10% and has hit the target in developing regions. And lastly, for Millennium Development Goal number 8, Global Partnership, bilateral sector allocable aid has gone up every year between 2008 and 2010. So what does this mean? This means that the UN is improving on all of its Millennium Goals, which begs the question, how can we be failing if we're still making these successes? I will now go on to my second argument, which is justifiable or unavoidable. Not all of the UN's actions haven't been a failure. So, for like, in the example of Syria, lack of action, circumstances to intervene, such as sovereignty, come into play. Peacekeepers must be invited, and peacekeepers have not been invited in Syria. Or, giving, or in the example of Somalia, when Amanda Pitt from the UN said that the circumstances of access were not available. Now, what's really here is that what affirmative is seen as failures are really acts of legitimacy, which we see as success. If the UN intervenes when it's not supposed to, then it will lose legitimacy and power. I would now like to clash with my worthy opponents. So they said that we must hold the UN accountable to its own standards. But what more do we hold it accountable than to its own Millennium Goal, which we have already proved to we have been improving on. Now they said that, that it takes a long time and it's like inefficient and that countries aren't unanimous. Countries will never agree. That has been a problem before the UN existed and will still be a problem after the UN existed because those are circumstances in which the UN cannot control. And they talked about dictators. Here's the thing, is that the UN provides a unique circumstance and situation where countries can get together and talk about world events that no other place does. So UN, the United Nations has made mistakes, yes, but that doesn't discredit the work they've done. Just remember, when you're choosing affirmative, you're choosing a world that will have nothing. And these conflicts will fester, spill over, and create an environment where criminals can operate and terrorists can find a safe haven. Ambassador to Susan Rice, U.S. Department Representative. So basically, if we have you, if we're going to discredit the U.N. based on a few failures, we're allowing a world where there will be no communication. I'll now stand for cross-examination.
challenging development goals are the targets in which the UN w is wanting to reach and accomplish so they yes. can help Okay, but it's aspects. not the reason why UN was not created to fulfill these millennium goals. Well, these millennium goals are a yes or no. crucial Could you just get part. a yes or no? Like, it is a crucial part, but do you believe that the UN was made to fulfill these millennium goals? Yes, because even if that wasn't okay, initially so the task, it still has to accomplish these areas as an ish international body. Okay, that awesome. Thing. Okay, so are you a sumo wrestler? Obviously not. Okay, <laughs> but even if you researched it and read all about it and you knew the diet they had, how much they were to train, would that make you a sumo wrestler? If I really wanted to be a sumo wrestler, but if you just read about it, dedicated, it. you can never achieve anything yeah. if you're just. No, well, if you just be sure, I agree. But what if you told even all your friends that you were a sumo wrestler? You, that still wouldn't make you a sumo wrestler, right? Well, I would question whether they believe yeah, you or not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, do you think that protecting women's rights is one of the core values of the UN? Is why it was founded? The UN is not only meant to protect right, those mm -hmm. rights, but also I agree on aspects of the environment. I agree. But that you say that that was one of the core issues, would you not? Yes, like, yes, that was one of the core issues. Okay, so then you think that the UN would set up and go to great measures to, in, in doing what it said, in protecting human rights. Well, the UN would put, try the best it can. Of yes. course, any okay. body will not be successful 100% of the yes. time. Okay, thank you, Jessica. I'm just going to this. This is too short. <laughs> I now call upon the second of her women's speaker. speaker. Margaret Ong, who will speak for five minutes and be cross-examined by the second negative speaker for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, a belief not enacted in reality is not reality. It's just a belief. It's a delusion. When we see that the problem with the UN right now is they're living in the illusion that they're actually making a difference. That, there's, that the goals that they set up, the foundational goals that they set up when they were first created <coughs> are being fulfilled. And that's why we here in Proposition are proud to propose and tell you that the UN is failing right now in our world today. I'm going to do three things for you today. First, I'm just going to go into the case here on the Proposition side. And then second, I'm going to repeat the contentions of my worthy friends. And third, I'm just going to try to sum up what I said. So Josh did an awesome job, and he came up here and told you his first two points. And they were both C's. The first one was criteria. He told you that the criteria that the UN was supposed to meet, one of them, for most of them, being protecting um, human rights, and the second one being a place where um, leaders and countries could get together and negotiate. The second point that he brought up was cannot unite. He told you that there's problems not only with what they're doing, but the structure itself, there are problems in it in itself. He talked about the Security Council. He talked to, told you today that the vetoing power that we have given certain countries is hindering them from actually succeeding. And the third one I'm going to talk to you today is the third C, and it's causes harm. This, the UN causes harm because the very system it is created, and I'm going to tell you about the UN's rights committee, the very system of it hinders it from actually doing what the purpose that they want to do. Now, like I told you, like I questioned Jillian in my, um, in my, in, in the cross X period, I told her, if you were a sumo wrestler and you believed it and you told all your friends, you did your research, does that still make you a sumo wrestler? Of course not, because unless she actually did something, and actually, unless she actually trained, that doesn't actually make her a sumo wrestler. It's when she gets out on the mountain and starts eating what sumo wrestlers are supposed to eat is when she becomes a sumo wrestler. And we believe that with the UN. The UN can tell you that it fights and protects for human rights, but in that, unless we actually see that happening, we see that's a flaw and we see that it fails. And I'm now I'm just going to tell you about the UN Human Rights Committee itself. The Human Rights Committee right now is very ineffective. First of all, the very, the, what the Human Rights Committee is, it's a, it's a um, committee made up of 18 experts that they say. But a lot of times these 18 experts are not experts itself. We see that a lot of times their government, their government, they work at the government services, such as ambassadors or cabinet ministers. So when we see that when there are certain cases brought up, when there are certain reports gotten up, we see that they're not actually independently making a choice for themselves on what's right or wrong. That they're simply government mouthpieces. We see that another problem with it, it's ineffective in the way where it only meets three times in a year. We see that this is a major flaw, because if so, this being one of the core issues in which the UN is standing for, but there are, this committee is only meeting three times a year, we see that it's ineffective. It's powerless in its way if it's not actually going to do anything. And the main problem that we here in Proposition have a problem today is we see that they're powerless. 
we see that they're powerless in their way where they don't actually, the most that the UN um, Rights Committee can do is share their views to states. So that's the most that they can do. They can tell a state that we don't believe in this. So we see that that's a, that's a huge failure because it's not actually accomplishing anything. It's just doing talking. So that's why we see that the UN um, Rights Committee has failed today. And this problem is not only um, with the UN Rights Committee. It's, a, it's an endemic problem in the UN bodies, like Josh told you. Now I'm going to refute the contentions made by my British opponents. Jillian came up here today and she told you the awesome things that are happening in our world today. She told you things like poverty is going down. She told you things like morality has dropped. We see that things like this are not directly uh, should be are not directly accredited to the UN. We see that a lot of times what the UN does is it goes into a country and it teams up with an organization. We see that that organization is actually what is helping the UN, what is helping these problems from um, dropping, not the UN. We also see that the main problem with the UN is like it's in its millennium goal. It's very short-sighted. We see that what happens is they go in there and for five years they do great work. But people that depend on them, after those five years are done, they just leave. We see that that's a huge problem because it doesn't make a lasting change. We see that the problem with the Rosie Ponds is that they have not proved that the UN with the, that the, all the statistics that they brought up was directly attributed to the UN. They told you the stats, but we see that to say that that was because the UN has existed is a failure, is, is not right. The second point that she also said, and what was interesting here on the proposition side, she kept telling you this. She said, we know the UN has made mistakes. She said over and over again, even in her second point, she said, we know that the UN has mistakes, but it's justifiable. And we see that in these circumstances, where we are in our world today and the power that the UN has, it is never justifiable. We see that the problem is that they have so much power to do what is right, but we see that that, that the mistakes that they're making for our, for our ways are success. And that is why we here in the proposition believe that, um, yeah, we believe that the UN has failed over and over again. And that is why we are proud to propose. Thank you. And now I stand open for a question. Thing. But if the school's goal is for 
all children to read at grade level, at like a regular school like this yeah. one, if their goal is for children to read at grade level and there are people who do not, is that school considered a failure? Um, no, but I think that if there were like other organizations, like after school programs that they were, the kids were going to, that it can't directly be like the school's success. Like I think it's also like there's many like options and why that child can read. Like, okay. Um, and just as a question, the criteria you laid out for the UN, would it be considered a criteria for all international government? All? Um, or just the UN? I think it depends on the international um, organization for sure. Okay, and when your partner already agreed that countries have fought before and they won't agree, how can any international organization fit your criteria for the UN? I think, I, can I just answer? I think I can, right? No? Okay. So I think that... I, I, I see where you're going with that, but I think that the problem we see is that we've given certain countries, like um, China or the U.S., extra powers in where that they can um, dominate over other countries, okay. and that's the main problem. Thank you. Thank you. I now call upon the negative speaker, Leora Beckham, who will speak for five minutes, then be cross-examined by the first affirmative speaker for three minutes. Gentlemen, at the heart of this debate today is a simple question. Has the United Nations as an institution done more harm or good? Now my opponents believe that this institution as a whole has failed because there have been some mistakes and some parts are less effective than there would be in an ideal world. Now my partner has already proven to you today that the mistakes were justifiable or unavoidable and that they're the, and the most critical criteria that actually the UN should be able to be met. I'll prove that while the UN is not perfect, it is better than nothing. And also that the UN has overall made substantial progress. So ladies and gentlemen, while the UN, first of all, I'd like to do just a little bit of refutation with my opponents. So in their whole idea of criteria, they've talked about how the main thing of the UN is to protect human rights. But ladies and gentlemen, the criteria that the UN set for themselves up were goals. And it's not fair or realistic for any international organization in the world we live in today for them to meet any of these goals, like being a center for harmony or being united in motions. Um, my, my partner actually asked the first affirmative if countries have argued before, if, they, if countries argue now, and we've already decided, and, we, and he proved that countries are still arguing now and that um, the system isn't perfect and it can't succeed 100% of the time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I also want to say a bunch of the examples that my worthy opponents have ta talked about, they re really were disagreed with, and my partner and I have both talked about this. But um, now moving on to my argument that while the UN is not perfect, it's better than nothing and has really benefited the world. So the UN has created peace more directly and indirectly. Imagine a world before the UN. All the negative things my opponents have mentioned happen, and if without the UN, they would have been much worse. In the 20th century alone, we've had two major world wars. 37,466,904 people died when were casualties of World War I. And nearly 50 million people died as a result of World War II. Six million from genocide alone. History of the net.com. Since the advent of the UN, there's been no major global conflicts and the number of deaths from warfare have dropped dramatically. The UN has succeeded 100% in preventing global wars, which was the main reason it was founded following World War II, not its millennium goals. What's more, the UN has created a belief in peace. The Human Security Report of 2005 states that the UN is responsible for over 60 years of comparative world peace. It cites a huge increase in the level of international preventative diplomacy, diplomatic peacekeeping, uh, peacemaking, and peace building operations for the most part authorized by and mounted by the United Nations that has occurred since the end of the Cold War in particular there's been a six-fold increase in UN preventative diplomacy missions, a four-fold increase in UN peace operations, which reduced the risk of wars restarting, and an 11-fold increase in the number of states subject to UN sanctions. If my opponents can't accept this as success, given the fact that we humans are fundamentally aggressive, I'd like to hear about the time the world has set a better standard when led by an international organization other than the UN. Clearly, the UN has succeeded on a massive scale. Now, Proposition today said that they that the UN hasn't really done anything humanitarianly. I'd just like to talk about this for a minute. The UN makes a huge humanitarian difference. The World Food Program and partner organizations have delivered food assistance to 
4.3 million people around the globe every year. Poverty rates continue to go down. The world is still on track to reach the poverty reduction goal and target in their Millennium Goals by 2015. And it's now expected that the global po poverty rate will fall below 15%, well under the 23% target rate. When you are meeting some of the hardest challenges of, hum of humanity, how can you be said to fail, ladies and gentlemen? Perhaps the greatest measure of the fact that the UN has succeeded is the simple fact that many fewer children are dying. The number of deaths of children under the age of five declined in to, from 12.4 million in 1990 to 8.1 million in 2009. This means that nearly 12,000 fewer children are dying each day, and my part, and my, in CrossX, my opponents agreed that this was a very good thing and that the UN was responsible for this. The benefits created by the UN are so great that it's hard to imagine the harm equal to all those lives saved and improved. And even if there have been harms, they were not significant for three reasons. One, they would have existed without the UN. Two, the UN has made them better. And three, the UN has learned from its mistakes and did not remake them. Thank you. I will now stand for cross-examination. Sylvia Ora, did you know that countries on the Human Rights Council are entrusted with the duty of protecting human rights around the world? Yes, I also know the United Nations is responsible for a lot of other things. Okay, so um, do you think that the UN is really a beacon of human rights? Do you think that it's helping? Yes, I talked about it a bunch in my speech. Okay. Yeah, and so do you think Sudan is helping to promote human rights around the world? Well, Sudan is one of the most successful fellow uh, successful African nations now that the UN war has intervened. Okay, so um, have so has Mauritania helped to promote human rights abroad around the world? I would say that Mauritania is one circumstance that the UN has not done very well, but because the UN is the only international governing body and it's the only one that's ever existed, it has to learn from its mistakes by trial and error in order to get more. So successful. don't you think? that it's contradictory and hypocritical for the UN to have these countries on the Human Rights Council? Like, it's kind of like having the bullies on the anti-bullying board. Well, I think that we need to acknowledge that all countries in the world should have an equal say, and although some people, like, we can't oppress our opinions on other people, so even though if we don't necessarily agree with what they stand so, for, we can try to talk. So you think that if someone doesn't believe in human rights, that's a legitimate view? Well, that it's okay? I myself am like am not super good with it, but okay. like I think we need to talk about it to okay. other countries. Are countries in the UN united? No, and I don't think that countries have really ever been particularly united or agree on things. Okay, so when the UN said in the UN Charter, when it said, and I quote, to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, it said that it would unite nations. How has it significantly done that? So that would be one of the goals that the United Nations has set for itself after it was created, right. along with a bunch of the other goals that it is slowly attaining. But humans in their nature are not necessarily willing to agree on all things. It's so, something we need to accept. So you admit that the UN is not necessarily unified in all aspects? No, and I don't think any And you admit that uni unity was one of the goals of the UN? Not the criteria, but one of their goals, yes. yes. one of their goals. So does fail mean the UN didn't obtain its goal? What does like what does fail mean? Does it mean what does it what does fail mean to you? Fail means that the um, the organization has not tried to do anything. They repeatedly fail on the exact okay. same mistake over and over again. Okay. So when the UN was founded, what was its goal? Why it why was the UN created? To prevent global conflict. To which prevent global succeeded. conflict. Yes. So it wasn't to help to reduce poverty? No, that's one of the Millennium Goals, which it was set up after the UN was made, uh, along with uh, reducing polio and AIDS. Okay. Which they're slowly all su yes. succeeding. So that would be a side benefit or a goal, but not really the purpose of why the UN was established. No. All right, thank you. Now be a five minute break while the debaters prepare their summation and rebuttals. Ladies and gentlemen, I will do my rebuttal today in the framework of three main questions. Is the United Nations essential? Do, does the United Nations mistakes mean it has failed? 
and has it had more successes than failures? So I'll start off with, is the United Nations essential? Now, Side Affirmative today has given you talks about how the UN is powerless and they brought up human rights, but what I would ask you today is how can the UN as an organization be powerless when it has accomplished so much in the areas of water, giving people safe drinking water, child morality, and for all the other Millennium Development Goals in my speeches. What Side Affirmative has failed to realize today is that human rights is just one of the basic, one of the small parts of the Millennium Development Goals. And there are eight in total, and human rights is only one. We see that there's also ones on, on education, on having women, women gender equality, and so we see that the UN has been critical to improving water sources and these children's uh, education. And if we didn't have the UN, the, the problems, conflicts that we have today would be much worse because there would be no solution and no area for change. Now they talked about how the successes I outlined in my speech were not really just the UN's doing, but they didn't provide any specific examples of what other groups have held the United Nations. What you need to remember today is the United Nations was the group that had founded UNICEF and founded the other groups that are working as part of the UN organization. Now on to my second question. Do the United Nations mistakes mean it has failed? And what we say is no. It might make one mistake, but that doesn't mean the whole organization has failed in general. It's like saying if you got a 90% on, on your math test, it might mean you failed at one question or one specific outcome, but you still got a 90, and that's a very high passing mark. Now, they decided to bring up that of how in Syria, how the UN is failing in Syria with the vetoes, and how in cross-examination, Josh answered that a, an organization should follow its own criteria for engaging and helping. And peacekeepers have not been invited in Syria, which means that this is not even a mistake. It's actually an act of legitimacy. So the UN is only 60 years old, and we see that that is relatively new to follow. Even though it may make a mistake, it has no one to follow and we're still making progress on all of our Millennium Development Goals, which we see is a success. Now on to my third question. Has it had more, mis more successes than failures? Now obviously the UN has made mistakes. There's no denying that. But, but what the side affirmative is trying to make you believe that a go governing body like the United Nations can be 100% successful all the time. And we see that this is an unrealistic dream and won't be possible. The UN faces challenges any international governing body would, and there's no way to get rid of those problems. Now we see that we're still improving and succeeding on our targets, in, such as in international relations, such as increasing child, making safety standards in airports, in ex, exports, and reducing global warfare, and health and child morality. Now, side affirmative said, at the beginning of my speech, I gave side affirmative a push burden, and they had to prove to you today in order to the win, in order to win, that the UN isn't meeting its Millennium Development Goals, and in fact, it's going backwards. But we see they have not addressed this question at all. They've said that there's specific veto problems and stuff, but they haven't actually proven to you why the facts that I said in my speech were discredited. Now call upon the first affirmative speaker to deliver the affirmative, affirmative rebuttal for four minutes. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to look at this debate today through two main themes. First, what is the UN's goal and what standards should it be held to? And secondly, has the UN helped? Now, I will show you why both of these, go both of these themes have clearly landed on the government side of the house today. So really, what were the UN's goals? Now, unfortunately, this was an area that was largely misunderstood by the side opposition. The UN was founded in 1948 for the global prevention of war, for the global protection of human rights, and for the unifying of, for the unifying of countries around the world. It says so in the UN Charter. It, however, does not say that the UN was founded for the purpose of foreign aid, for raising um, literacy rates around the world, for example. And although these are nice things, and we're glad the UN has taken them and has, has chosen to do them. I think that's only one example of success. 
but it's not an example of why the UN has not failed. Because failure is essentially defined by not meeting its goals. So when we look at the UN Charter, we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and we see the self-made goals of the UN, that the UN would protect human rights, that would unify countries around the world. And we see that those two haven't been dealt with, and that, those, and that the arguments showing why these goals are not met were never thoroughly clashed with by the opposition. We say that the UN has failed because it has not achieved those goals. What is failure? Failure is never good. Failure is never justifiable. No more is it justifiable in the international sense, the sense of the UN, where every time the UN messes up or makes a mistake, hundreds of people die. Besides, the arguments that we brought up weren't simply examples of one failure. They were showing you the structural errors of the UN that disable it from being able to be successful, that these are structurally, in, structurally put into the UN. They're not simple one-time mistakes. Side opposition said that we're learning from our mistakes. However, we didn't hear any evidence of when this has happened. We look and we see evidence to the contrary, that after Rwanda, there was Congo, and that the UN simply repeats its mistakes over and over because it is structurally flawed. And that was never really dealt with by the opposition side. So ultimately, to prove one side or the other, there has to be a balance of proof. Not one example of success, not one example of failure. So when we see a case which says that only Millennium Goals have been successful, we say that although that is great, and although the UN may be helping in that area, we have to look in the broader sense. And in the broader sense, what the UN was essentially there for, what it was created for, has not been met, and it has not been done. Now the second theme that I'd like to address is has the UN help, helped? Now, um, side opposition brought up some interesting statistics about how wars have been reduced. And, all we, and we don't really see this as being necessarily true. We think that countries still have rivalries. It's just that now it is um, mitigated to espionage, to drone strikes, to proxy wars like Vietnam and Korea. And it's not actually really um, a, bi a good statistic. And besides, even if wars were declining, we didn't hear how this is directly related to the UN. Is this because of mutually assured destruction? Is this because of NATO's intervention, NATO's presence in the world? We don't really see an answer for these questions. Also, about the Millennium Goals, we say that although this was nice, we don't necessarily think that's strictly because of the UN. Although sometimes there were logical links between the action and the, and the result, we see that in many of the examples brought up, this could have simply been because of global progression. The Red Cross also does huge work around the world. And we see that this isn't necessarily because of the UN, and it's not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. But what we do see around the world is people who are having their human rights abused. People who are living under notorious dictators, and who the UN said, we will help you, we will be there for you. But unfortunately, when we look at a sim simple look at the facts, shows us that the UN isn't there for them. And it's in favor of those people that we stand here today and we stand proud to say that the UN has failed.